straight on to I should move straight on to the, my uh, my next slide. So today's about having a conversation in the groups. Um, so we've got three 15 minute presentations and Victoria and I will try our very best to not go over that because the three 30 minute discussions are more important. And they're set up according to these three headings, which will make a bit more sense as we go through. In order to talk about um, some of the work that Victoria and I have been involved in, in looking at the ethics of public involvement or ethically good practice in involving patients and the public in research from both sides of things. Um, we felt we needed to go through a bit of a journey around sort of what ethics is all about and all the way through to that. Having read your biographies, which I really enjoyed seeing the range of skill, knowledge, skills and experience from research, from public involvement, from lived experience as patients and members of the public, um, I feel a little nervous, unusually for me, in that there are people on the call who know far more about ethics than I do. So if you if I say something you think is overly simplistic and but 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 it's more complicated than that, please please bear with me because it's about just some prompts um, for the discussion. So without further ado, I'll move us on to the first first session. So you don't need permission. What about well, you don't need permission to think ethically. In fact, you should. So this is just to recognize there are ethical issues in every aspect of our lives and we need to think about them. And we do think about them. Sometimes we don't think about them consciously, but we do think about them. So I'm just going to go through some very broad, very, very broad definitions of ethics. Um, look at the different types of ethics and then think, start to think about our responsibilities. And that will come into specifics about public involvement. And we felt, we felt it was important to set, up, set an overall context. So very broadly, ethics is, a, is essentially is a branch of philosophy. It's about moral principles that govern a person's behavior or the conduct of an activity. Um, and it, it's grounded essentially in, in the way we as humans interact with each other, behave towards each other. Um, and I see it very much as about being uh, about mutual respect and recognition of um, what I call power dynamics. So that pe some people have more authority or are in a position of control more than others. And we need to be, we need to recognize that and try to address the balance or imbalance of that. And it's about rightness and wrongness of certain actions. Um, but it's not about facts per se, it's about opinions. So there may be um, different, different views um, and one person might not be absolutely categorically right and somebody else might not be categorically wrong, but we all have a view about these things. Um, in, as, a, as a core discipline, um, there are four branches of ethics, and I'm not going to go through this in any detail, but to say that essentially descriptive, normative and meta-ethics are really around the sort of philosophical study of rightness and wrongness of actions, people's beliefs, um, what those things mean and, and how, how you go about evaluating and discussing and, and uh, uh, thinking about uh, good and bad, rightness and wrongness. Applied ethics is what we're talking about today and uh, the different sorts of research that or different sorts of ethics that we're going to talk about are all in the area of applied ethics, which is taking those attitudes and thinking from mainly from normative ethics, but also descriptive and meta ethics and applying that into real life situations. So on to getting a little bit closer to what we're talking about. So within the, the, that branch of applied ethics, there are a number of um, defined uh, ethical domains, as they're often referred to, sort of areas of ethic, ethics. I haven't included here bioethics, which is a very broad category, which encompasses the ones I've put on here as well, because it's covering the whole of biological sciences. Um, but there's medical ethics, which I'm sure many of you are responsible are, are aware of, and that's about medical practice. And a lot of that's in the um, in the public domain at the moment because of the the ongo ever ongoing debate about assisted dying. Lots of ethical issues around that, uh, rightness and wrongness, and and so opinion. It, it really illustrates that it's very much about opinion, and that there's no absolutely right or wrong answer. Social care ethics around social care practice, so it's distinct from medical practice, although medical ethics really these days is often referred to as health healthcare ethics um, by some people. And then research ethics, which is getting much closer to what we're all about. All of us on the call have some role in 
health and social care research, whether we're conducting it or contributing our thoughts and ideas in other ways um, or managing it or regulating it. Um, and in the context of what we're talking about, and I'll say a little bit more about this because there are more than essentially more than one type of research ethics as well, is it's about research into human health or social care with human participants uh, or identifiable data or clinical material means samples that we we debate or we have. And then what we're really talk, hoping to discuss and talk about is um, the ethics of public involvement itself. And so research ethics, which is an um, I think is an unfortunate, slightly unfortunate, overly simplified term. The research ethics we're talking about and the ones that one that you'll be familiar with is as defined by the Declaration of Helsinki, which was written by the World Medical Medical Association originally, the original version in 1964, and there have been umpteen revisions, and it's currently being reviewed. Um, and it's a statement of ethical principles for medical research, which for which and I think the new version will probably say health and social care research, involving human participants. And those of you who've read it, and I'd encourage you all to read it if you haven't, will know that currently it says human human subjects, but that dehumanizing term will be taken out in the new version. And so I've taken the license of including it here, including research on identifiable human material and data. So in that definition from the Declaration of Helsinki, which I'm going to repeat quite a few times, it isn't all research and it's not all health and social care research, but as defined by the Declaration of Helsinki, it's that specifically about protecting participants in research and protect. And I've put protecting in uh, in uh, quotes because it's a somewhat paternalistic term, but actually um, it it, uh, it it really means about respecting people. Um, further background to as which many of you probably already know um, to this definition of research ethics is of course the Nuremberg Code following the uh, appalling things that were done during the Second World War. And then later, the uh, the Belmont Report in 1978 about the Tuskegee syphilis experiment in America, um, completely unethical research, which has refined how the Declaration of Helsinki uh, is now written. Um, but so that whilst there are different types of research ethics and different research ethic frameworks or, um, or descriptions, the one we're talking about is the one defined by the Declaration of Helsinki for health and social care research, currently referred to as medical research. Um, Victoria, you've got some thoughts to add in here as well. I'll hand well, over to you. Thank you. It's really following on from your talking about the research ethics is specifically about protecting participants in research. Um, and this concept aligns with the seeking to be ethical in protecting public patient and public involvement contributors. And it can take many forms, this protecting. For instance, in a study which would be recruiting school-age young people, if the researcher is sending information about the research to their parents, um, the researchers may need to be um, made aware or have in mind that not all young people may be living with their parents. They may be in care or they may be with foster parents or carers or guardians or have been placed in residential. So the wording should address these options in order not to cause any distress or um, uncomfortableness um, of either they or the people being addressed, the parents or carers, feeling sidelined um, because both the young people and their long parent, non-parent, have responsibility for them. So that's just a thought. Um, next slide is back to Jim. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. And that Victoria's points there just bring us from my sort of rather dry definitions onto beginning to get into what we're really talking about here. So the ethics of public involvement, it isn't a formal discipline. It's not a recognized discipline like, um, like research ethics or um, bioethics, but it is obviously related to health and social care research. So research bear being a shorthand term again for health and social care research and health and social care research ethics, or to give it a very long and unwieldy title, the ethics of research into human health 
involving uh, human participants or their um, clinical material or data, which doesn't really lend itself to a, an abbreviation or even an acronym. Um, and it's to say that research ethics is is important, but research ethics isn't the right way to look at patient and public involvement, although it relates to it. And just two quick points to make here, and I'll, we'll go on to talk more about this in the next, next session after the first discussion. Research ethics doesn't apply to the involvement of patients and the public in designing a study. Um, and we'll talk about exactly why that is when we go, go forward, because as defined by the Declaration of Helsinki, when, you, when researchers work with patients and the public, they're not doing research on their health or their health or social care. They're talking to them. They're, help, they're working as a team to design, design a study. There can be ethical issues, research ethics issues, as defined by the Declaration of Helsinki from patient and public involvement when uh, patients or members of the public are co-researchers working on a study where there are human participants. But that would never be considered by a research ethics committee, which I'll talk about in the next session, in and of itself, it, that study would be being reviewed by a research ethics committee because it's a study into human health. And as part of that, the potential ethical issues of a, 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 a public co-researcher having contact with participants would be part of the, the broader research ethics review of that study. So it's, and, and again, we'll repeat this a little bit when it comes to it, but just to say for a, a first point that research ethics committee review doesn't apply, research ethics doesn't apply to involvement in study design. So that's the kind of broad background to get us thinking. The next, uh, we, we, I see I'm doing well for me, at least on timing. So we're now gonna go into the small group discussions and an overarching question. So having heard what you've heard, knowing what you all know, some of which is a lot more than I know, and the, the but, but, but issues you may have come up with. How do you all view your own responsibilities about for thinking about ethics and thinking about ethical issues in the work that you do and in your personal life? So this might be very specific, you might think immediately very specifically to um, public involvement. So the work that you do to either to involve patients in the public or those of you who are public contributors, the work you do with researchers to help design better, better research. Well, you might want to think about it more widely because there's lots of overlap in this. And it's about um, thinking respectfully, thinking about each other um, and working well. So that's our broad question. But feel free to go beyond that if things that I've said and Victoria said have prompted you um, to, to do that. So that's our, that's our very broad question for the first small group discussion. What do, you, what do you think of your own responsibilities in thinking about ethics? Excuse me, thinking about ethics. How do you think ethics? What are the common eth ethical issues you come across in your work? Um, I hope you all had a good conversation. The one I was listening to, and I didn't say anything, was fantastic and raised lots of really, really important issues. And I think has got us in the right place. So I was quite relieved that I think, I think we pitched it kind of right. Um, the second session, agency, agency, and agency. This this is about um, the responsibilities of individuals and organisations for ethical issues, and we'll get into how that relates to research ethics issues, into public involvement issues. So I'm going to just present very briefly about the roles and responsibilities. First of all, of, of individuals, so researchers, chief investigators, and that will cover public contributors as well. Then talk in terms of the other side of agency organizations and research ethics committees, which are usually uh, abbreviated to RECs. Um, but also talk about the fact that not all research ethics committees are the same and that there are there is a difference between the ones run for the NHS, the NHS RECs versus what I've called by the general term institutional review boards or IRBs, which are in universities and other organizations. But, one of the things I was really struck by in the in the um, the biographies, and I and I hope you don't mind me, Peter, quoting from yours, but you really summed up what this is all about when you said that we need to work in fair, equal, and inclusive ways with each other, doing research, and that's what ethics are all about for me. And I couldn't agree with you more. I think you've really you really summed it up very well. Um, 
Victoria, you're going to want to say something here before we go into the sort of the, the, the specifics. So okay, over thank to you. you. Um, one of the points which Jim has made is that not all ethics committees are the same. And I'm um, the lay representative on a medical school research governance and ethics committee. And I find it absolutely fascinating as it can take me in my head um, all over the world to places like Ethiopia, Bangladesh, Mexico, Syria. As with all PPI, it gives the opportunity to put oneself in the shoes of the potential participants. But that's actually not quite correct because some of the research is looking at whether the condition, which um, the very distressing condition, which the people being having research done on is to do with the lack of shoes, um, making problems, very severe problems in the legs. Um, but getting back to the ethical approaches to the PPI element of lay people on Rex, I have to say that in my experience, it comes from the top, um, how good it is, because um, to me, the chair was wonderful at welcoming me, degree less me, amongst highly qualified specialists and professors, people like the majority of you here today, um, and always turning to me to ask if there was something that I would like or needed to say. And um, I very often did, and very basic points sometimes, um, but they said that I had spotted something which none of the other people had, um, which was crucial. So that made me feel very valued. And that attitude has continued with the subsequent chair um, and also the all important senior research ethics and integrity officer. And I've put that in because I so like the word integrity. So on to the next slide, which is Jim's. Thank, thank you, Victoria. And that sets us up nicely to think about the roles and responsibilities of individuals in the first place. So, one slide. So you might be wondering what this slide is and why I've put it up. Um, some of you might recognize it um, if you're as old as I am. This is Mrs. Do As You Would Be Done By, who was one of two moral guides for the water babies in Charles Kingsley's, Kingsley's fairy tale of the same name from 1863. And Mrs. Do As You Would Be Done By, she's kind and gentle and fair. And she treats the water babies as she would like to be treated in contrast to the other moral guardian, Mrs. Dunby, as he did, <clears throat> who is stern, strict and punitive, behaving towards them as they did towards others whom they didn't treat very kindly. And I rather like this because it's a way of illustrating what's sometimes referred to as the golden rule of civilization. If you don't like it yourself, then best not to do it to somebody else. And that's a very central tenet of pretty much all of the world's religion and actually to all intents and purposes to applied ethics. Um, unfortunately, or maybe actually fortunately, um, as a child, I read The Water Babies and the character of Mrs. Doersy would be done by has stuck with me into adulthood. Well, maybe not the character, but actually that, that phrase, do as you would be done by, and that inference that if you treat people as you would like to be treated, and hopefully then you can get uh, re received treatment back in the same way. So what's that got to do with all of this? Well, Responsibility for good ethical practice, as our discussions in, in the group I was uh, part of showed, it's, it's all of our responsibilities. We're all responsible for it. And we're responsible for our actions in the way we interact with our fellow human beings in all walks of life. And that came through really clearly that some, you know, one of, one of us in my group said, you kind of have an internal conversation with you about what's ethical, and then you've got to, got to get it out there and discuss it as well. And I think we think about these things without realizing we're thinking about it when we interact. And so the do as you would be done by is, is, is very much something that uh, there's a mantra for my own life. But how does that manifest itself in research? Well, I think it's, for me, it's about um, all of our roles are, very, are different but complementary in the research process. And it's about designing and conducting health and social care research studies that any of us would consent to take part in. So in the sense, the research is doing as it would be done by. Uh, Victoria? Um, 
I've had a few thoughts here, so please bear with me. Okay, um, something that it might be pertinent to put our ethical thinking caps on about might be to do with this example, which is by implication, um, a patient and public involvement ethical matter. It's to do with appointing a lay person to say a trial steering committee, which is lauded as a good thing, um, as it shows you are including PPI, which is great. However, it would be most ethical if the process started before the trial actually began. And if any PPI person who joins the trial steering committee when the trial has already started, it would be good if um, they were welcomed in a similar manner as I described previously, um, rather than left feeling possibly at the bottom of the pile, surrounded by surgeons with no effort being made to bring along the lay person who happened to be feeling quite disempowered. Um, and I'm sure that this kind of occurrence happens unintentionally and thoughtlessly. And the great trick is to bring the consequences of thoughtlessness to people's ethical minds. How would I feel if, like Jim's, do as you would be done by? Another example of thoughtlessness, which could easily be resolved at no cost to anybody, but huge benefits to all concerned, would be if clinicians, specialists, professors attending research funding meetings could stop and listen to the views of PPI public contributors rather than going in with seemingly or maybe not, but seemingly already closed minds because the PPI attendees may have an important point which um, may affect recruitment or the end result um, of the research. But if it's not being considered by the clinicians, by the researchers, um, it's the researchers and the research who will have missed out and will have unintentionally also possibly deflated the PPI members. It would be helpful if organizations could think of PPI as being relational as in relationships rather than transactional, as in we are unable to pay for your bus fare unless you give us all your bank details and you might get reimbursed in a month. In a month. And not said, but too bad if you're on, on benefits and can't afford to wait. And we realize that you probably might not be able to come again, um, although we do want you to. If PPI could be in as in an opera, everybody looking to their own important role, whatever that role is, um, because it all adds to the success of the research or the organization. There is a link if um, everybody could keep it in their minds between opera operating, which is a medical and also a management term, and theater, operating theater, where it all comes together in both surgery and in drama, and the best ethical thing to do is to listen to the strength of the patient voice in the same way as the orchestra looks to the conductor and the conductor listens to the orchestra and responds meaningfully, it sensitively. That will all be good for research. Thank you for listening to that bit. Um, the next slide is Jim. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you for bringing uh, sort of my drier words to, to, to life. Just want to talk a little bit about um, research in the NHS and the responsibilities for uh, all of the people that do that research. So the Health Research Authority working with the uh, its equivalents in Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland produced a policy framework for health and social care research um, quite, quite some time ago. And it's a it's a kind of slightly dry, dusty document, but it's very important because it sets out what are the responsibilities. And there are a number of key principles in that. One is about scientific and ethical conduct, conduct and the other is about patient and public involvement, which is, of course, very important. And it makes it clear um, the links between the two. And there are 11 initial principles. And it's very good to see public involvement as the fourth of those. But ethical practice is, is there. And 
the, the policy framework also then sets out the responsibilities for all the players, as it were. So just to highlight the chief investigators, which some of you are, um, are responsible for the overall conduct of a research project, including satisfying themselves. And that means thinking, doesn't it, about that the research they're doing, the proposal and the protocol make effective use of working with patients and the public and are scientifically sound, safe, ethical, legal and feasible. So it's a responsibility um, as set out in the policy framework for, uh, research, for researchers, but particularly the chief investigators to make sure that they are thinking ethically and all the members of their research team are thinking ethically. So that's the kind of individual responsibilities, just thinking briefly then about the organizational ones. So in terms of research ethics, you'll be familiar and several people have mentioned the Health Research Authority's role. So the Health Research Authority is responsible for NHS Research Ethics Committee in England and with the other um, uh, the devolved administrations as they're called for Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, it covers the UK as well. And there are around just over 80 um, research ethics committees for the NHS. And they are very well governed and managed. And there's a thing called the Governance Arrangements for Research Ethics Committees, which is abbreviated to GAFREC, which gives a kind of cons uh, a consistency of approach in those. But very importantly here, and for what I'm just about to say is, the Health Research Authority has no responsibility whatsoever for university or other research ethics committees or institutional review boards. More's the pity in my view, but there we are, which means that the larger number of institutional review boards than NHS research ethics committees, to a certain extent, do their own thing, but not to mean they don't do it well, but they are the same. Um, and that distinction is very important for this next point I want to make is that the Health Research Authority has all of its existence and then its pre-existence as a National Research Ethics Service working with the former involved, been absolutely clear at that point I made earlier that um, public involvement in designing a research study in the sort of planning and design stage does not need research ethics committee approval because it's not research into human health. But, and this is where our paper comes in, that does not mean that there aren't ethical issues associated with that. Um, it's interesting to see that in Ireland, the uh, Health Research Board for Ireland and the Irish Research Council working with the public involvement network there, which is called PPA, PPI Ignite, has very recently, um, for late last year, come up with basically the same statement from a large piece of work they did across the Republic of Ireland. So at least there's a consistency there, but that isn't necessarily always, as you, many of you may have experienced, in the, uh, the situation you may have come across in uh, working with an institutional review board. And we do see a lot of examples and, and our team gets a lot of questions about, despite our guidance, which has been around for 15 years, do I need, public, do I need research ethics committee approval to involve the public? Because a lot of institutional review boards still insist on reviewing plans for public involvement which is one of the reasons why uh, the, the team that Victoria and I are part of developed our ethical framework or ethical guide, um, which we're gonna talk about in more detail in the next session. But it leads us on to our next discussion session. So what does good ethical practice look like uh, where you work and in the activities you're involved in? And this is for everybody. This is you know, where you work either as an employee or as a public contributor and in the activities and work that you're involved in there. So focusing down on research and thinking about ethical practice in the research itself, but also then the ethical practice and the way that we interact with each other and particularly researchers work with patients and the public. So uh, we're now on to the next discussion, Thanks, everybody. Um, hope you had a fantastic further conversation as, as we had in, in our group. And uh, I learned some really interesting things. Um, from Sonny and Neil about an interesting way of uh, kind of getting conversations moving or keeping them on track with uh, some key words that, are, that, it, that they use in their work, such as mango for it's a bit off topic. It's a, we're looking a bit mango here. Well, there's too much rabbit. Somebody's, somebody's holding the, uh, too, much, too much time for themselves. Love that. Um, this last session is really getting us on to um, talk a little bit about the approach in, in the paper that was shared with you beforehand, um, which is an approach to good ethical practice in 
my big involvement. Um, before I kind of get into that in, in detail, I just want to reflect on um, a term which you may or may not be familiar with, which but which is I've seen in, reused increasingly when talking about patient and public involvement is to actually talk about working in partnership with people and communities. And I came across that via NHS England um, with a group that brings together different, different what are, are called rather strangely arm's length bodies, but you used to call agencies or quangos uh, for the Department of Health and Social Care. And NHS England used this term working in partnership with people and communities. And it, I like it because it uses the word partnership, that it's a proper part or it's intended to be a proper partnership. And from that come terms like public partners or patient partners or research partners, which is appropriately aspirational um, about what we're seeking to do here. Um, the, the main bit of the session, I'm going to introduce the paper um, a little bit where, it's, where it came from more than anything else, I say as an approach and creating a guide. Um, and then just sort of talk a little bit about responsibilities and approaches. And then Victoria and I are going to talk just through some of the uh, approaches in that paper um, as a prompt mm -hmm. for the further discussion, but particularly for the plenary this afternoon. Um, so Victoria, I'll just hand over to you now for, for some thoughts. Okay, um, thank you. Um, Jim's discussed the benefits of working in partnership with people and communities because it is all to do with relationships. Um, the last point on his um, slide is to do with approaches. Um, and my understanding of approaches is how does one approach potential PPI people to see if they might consider how to become involved? For me, it was a question of being asked. Um, I would have never in a million years have it, um, would it have occurred to me um, that this was something I could do and might be useful to someone in so doing. My PPI involvement came after I had been recruited following my stroke as a participant in the CLOPS trial. The research nurse then asked if she could give my details to Duncan Barron. Um, one of the authors in the next slide or so, um, when he was setting up a multi-generational Jaffa PPI group. Um, and I haven't stopped since. You are not alone can mean ask, explain gently what it is, who knew, where they can find further information, but also very good if you have that information to hand so they don't have to go to the effort of negotiating a website. Make it easy is a good way of attracting people to be involved. Now we're going on to another slide, I think. Thank you. Um, so, so the seed and approach ethically, not heavily. Responsibilities. Ethically, what do you think they are? One of them could be to do with safeguarding if you are including children and young people in research, well, as for adults, it's important to have young people on hand to let you know in what way of wording it will go down well and be easily understood by the young people and what will not. Young people can be great at getting at the nub of the meaning you're trying to impart. And here is a way, I, I know there are lots of um, young people, um, researchers here on the call, but just for those who haven't yet, um, there are various ways of uh, getting in touch with young people. There's the Generation R affiliation, um, and together with including PPI from young people, there's also the question of making sure that they are safeguarding, that those at meetings with them have got the appropriate DBS checks, and that at all times they are supervised so they can't come to harm, that there are processes in place in case a worrying disclosure is made or a fear that someone else might come to harm. There is also the consideration of providing ethical food um, to look out for allergies, and some people can have a lot of very serious allergies. So it may not just be a question of going to the supermarket 
and grabbing good value, sweet things. The ethical thing to do may be to spend more time reading labels, which are very small, so bring your magnifying glass along, and maybe having to budget more um, to overcome the allergies. The ethical question of safeguarding can also apply on ethical responsibilities to adults. In addition to looking out for them in a practical way, in case there might be signs of abuse or neglect, not eating. Um, there's also the question of trying to make the PPI experience as stress-free as, stress as possible. Location, timing, offer to bring someone with them if they wish, wish help with parking, availability to help, have a designated PPI person whom they can call on, all these thoughts and actions will help to make the process ethically conscious. It's all a question of having thought helpfully about it. What would not be ethically conscious would be if a whole lot of specialists convened a meeting about research and joined it, giving the impression that they, professors, consultants, specialists had already made up their minds. And so the PPI present representatives might feel that their views and the views of the people they were representing were not being listened to. But now Jim is going to show you the paper. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Victoria. And thank you for bringing things to, to life again. So, and thank you to all of you who uh, hopefully all had a look at least at the plain language summary of this paper, which as I said before, is a, an approach to the, the subtitle we've used, the developing ethically conscious standards or approaches to uh, researchers working with patients and the public and vice versa. Um, I just want to say a little bit about, about the paper. Um, what, one interesting reflection that I thought that came to me not that long after we published it was, I did rather regret that we used the word framework because there's way too many of those and they become, they get lost. You can't see the wood for the trees for frameworks. Um, and that we didn't use the simple phrase, you know, uh, in, uh, ethics of public involvement or something like that, but there we are. The key thing I think about this paper, and it's one of, there's a number of approach, other approaches to this area now in other countries. Canada, for instance, have done, uh, the Canadian Institute for Health Research has done some very good work and produced a very, very detailed uh, framework, possibly too but detailed maybe, and some more recent work in uh, the Netherlands and in Germany. So we're, we have, there's lots of thinking going on about this at the moment. And the, the title of this session, You're Not Alone, means that lots of people are thinking about it and there's lots of opportunities for us to think and talk together. The key thing I think about the work that, that, um, that was done in this paper by Duncan and Raksha was that it's a, it's, it's a practice-based piece of work. It's based on their, um, their practice as advisors in the research design services um, in the UK. So the, the, we have a wider team from the initial, initial publication, which was led by Duncan and, and Raksha that brought me on board. So as well as Victoria as one of our public contributors, we also have Jennifer Bostock. And then we have three other people, Lucy, Lucy Frith, Julie Pesci and Delia Muir, who worked in other research design services um, to Duncan and Raksha. And we took that original approach in the paper and have uh, consulted on it and tried to develop it a bit more um, over the last, well, between 2017 and 2020. The background, as I said, is in, was in their, Duncan and Raksha's practice advising researchers on public involvement and seeing things that they said they were going to do or thought of doing that were mostly and almost entirely inadvertent, but didn't seem quite right, didn't seem ethical. And that gave them this idea of presenting some kind of approach. And, I, and I'm erring towards the, uh, the approach of calling it a guide to good ethical practice in public involvement. It was initially presented ooh, 14 years ago at the Involve conference in 2010, when there were three issues to talk about. And through two further Involve conferences, to the publication in, in 20, 2017. And then our wider team did some consultation. So we've had input um, in various parts of the country, not just the East Midlands. And interestingly as well, uh, I was invited to talk about this work, the field trip in Sri Lanka. So actually I've talked to, I've talked to villagers in, Sri Lanka, in rural Sri Lanka about our approaches and 
gratifyingly and interestingly, they, they kind of understood it all. Um, what we've done in develop in, in, in taking it forwards is come up with a, um, a representation of it as a, as a five point star where we've grouped the original 10, but now 11 issues and solutions with safeguarding, which um, Victoria mentioned into five broad areas. And just to say very quickly from some comment in the chat, area A, detailed planning, kind of pulls into that allocating sufficient time for public involvement, but also links into D, the support from organizations, where we had this um, title registered with the R&D office, which really means about seeking support to, 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 uh, for the involvement from the resources available in the, in the organization or institution you work in which links to the UK standards for public involvement. And thank you, Barbara, for putting the link into that, into the chat. But I'm gonna let Victoria explain a little bit more about the approach and the STAR and just pick a few of those areas to say a little bit more about before we go into the, um, into the, uh, the further discussion. Victoria. Okay, thank you. Um, this shows all the aspects, or maybe there are more, but um, to date, um, which PPI and ethical considerations, how they come together. Um, one of these aspects is the safeguarding, both for adults and children, uh, which we touched on earlier. But sensitivity is another aspect, which um, I believe Sunny has raised today. Um, talking about research, talking about how to help research by PPI could bring back memories of the condition which um, is being researched and researchers need to be aware of that possibility and make contingencies in case that occurs. Another point of the STAR goes to fairness of opportunity. This takes us back to ask. Um, it also takes us back to children and young people. It's only, it is not only fairness of opportunity for the young people, it's fairness of opportunity for the researchers to have access to the views and reactions of the young people in their research. The YPAG, the Young People's Advisory Group, um, when their voice was heard, meant that some researchers went straight back to the drawing board to start again. Everything scrapped and start again. Um, how much time the YPAG had saved the researchers by making sure that the concept and the visuals and the wording were young people friendly. And this was for a very sensitive topic. So that's an interesting take on the um, concept of power in balance. In this case, it was the other way around. In some ways, if we think about doing things ethically and in a re relationship-based way, I think that PPI can almost go as far as the layperson is wanting to go. Apart from do the lay people think that the research itself is ethical, the lay people can suggest um, wording improvements, suggest diagrams, suggest more easily readable, readable fonts, and can query, 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 what and who and for how long and is it really necessary and can it be done some other way <clears throat> it's all important to the hope for success of the proposed research and now may i give a positive shout out for the ethically in my opinion um ethically con conscious british heart foundation both naturally in their research but also in this instance for their ppi they have a large patient advisory group on which my extended term has just come to an end. This group comments not only on the research proposal, but also on the quality of the separate PPI section where researchers have to say specifically how and with whom they have consulted on PPI matters. The British Heart Foundation sends out the papers well in advance, tells the patient advisory group when to expect them and when to return them by. Both the patient and public manager and officer respond to queries very promptly and helpfully, arrange travel and accommodation as needed, but also offer the option of um, joining online if health or logistical reasons might otherwise prevent attendance. 
they set up some lab tours of interest to the patient advisory group. In short, made the PPI members feel very valued and appreciated. They are a model, a star, in fact. And here's to the other patient, um, the other ethical public involvement in research design star, which you've been looking at it. Now, back to Jim. Thank, thank you, Victoria. Um, we could easily talk about um, the paper for ages. And I don't think that's the point here. It's to think about our thinking and how that our thinking can be can be taken forward. So for the last session, we really want to, and this is a, also leads into the afternoon session, is thinking about you know, how we as a research community and public involvement communities can take forward the thinking about good ethical practice in public involvement in research. As I said, our, our, our thinking is, is one approach, but I think its value is that it's been practice based from a, an advisory perspective, which gives it a degree of validity and that it's been tested a bit and we've consulted on it. But there's lots of ways to put this into practice. Um, and the key thing for us isn't you know, essentially ownership of something. It's more about supporting and getting as many people to think about these issues and, and work with and manage them as possible. So we'll end it there, Jürgen, so we can go into the, uh, the session.